What up guys, Joachim here, Justin Morgan. And uh, today I just wanted to do a brief video, hopefully it's brief anyway, on uh, some of this, the ideas of what is Western Christianity or what is the Western theological tradition, of course, referring to Western Christian theology. And uh, so it's this course that's offered by Hillsdale College. I don't know a ton about Hillsdale College, um, other than they, they have these courses which come up. And usually <clears throat> there are things that I am interested in, like uh, ancient Christianity or C.S. Lewis, uh, both things that I, I have high regard for. Um, as, you know, if you've watched my channel, you would probably guess that. But I, I've never actually signed up for one of the courses. I, I think I know uh, the wife of the, the Greek priest in my, my town, um, she, I think she actually graduated from here. We were talking about it one day. She was visiting, um, uh, our parish one day. So, uh, we were, I got to talking to her and uh, she, she just mentioned the college and I, I was familiar with it just from these types of ads. But what was wild to me was they mentioned the Western theological tradition referring to Western Christianity. But if you look at the names, they, they mentioned the Bible, of course, that would be part of the every Christian tradition. But then once they go to the people, like the influences that they're discussing, they jump from the New Testament in the first century, or at least it's canonized by uh, like the fourth century. Um, so they, you could say they jump from the fourth century or, or the first century, really, for the writings to Thomas Aquinas, which is like the 13th century. And then everything after that, Martin Luther, the Enlightenment, it, it all comes after that period. So they have like this nearly, well, really more than a thousand year gap in Western Christianity. Um, so the Western Europe, Western Europe becomes predominantly Christian in about the fourth century. So pretty early on, um, you, you see the rise of Christianity, um, you know, St. Joseph of Arimathea, uh, along with St. Aristobulus of the 70, who's mentioned in the book of, uh, uh, well, he's mentioned with the 70 uh, apostles who Christ sends out to the to the cities, uh, St. Aristobulus. He's mentioned in a few letters, but he makes it to, he and uh, uh, St. Joseph of Arimathea make it to the British Isles. So they make it to uh, the islands, uh, uh, the westernmost islands uh, of uh, Europe. I don't know that they make it quite to Ireland by that time, so, but they, they make it to the British Isles anyway. And so there's this um, seed which is planted in the furthest reaches of the West, or at least, I guess, you know, discounting America, the, the furthest reaches of the West that is known of the de that day. And, you know, so Christianity begins to take root there in the first century. And then by the fourth century, the predominant religion throughout all of Europe is Christianity. So why then would a course skip over entirely uh, the, the, the foundations of Christianity to move only to like these these areas. And so my, my argument, which you can kind of see there, is in fact that this is actually not Christianity. This is the apostasy of Christianity. And, and this course is presenting these theological views held by Aquinas forward as, as like the, the Western tradition. But this is not the Western cr tr Christian tradition. This is the apostasy from the Western Christian tradition. So I, I personally, as a Western man who is an Orthodox Christian, I, I want to know about the Western Orthodox tradition. I, I want to know about the, the people who held to the one undivided church. I want to know about the Western tradition that existed amongst those who were in communion with the East and the West, the Celtic Christians, the, the, the Christians of, of Britain, uh, and, and then, you know, the, the, Christian, the Christians of Western Christian, the Western Christian tradition of uh, Europe, Western Europe more widely, whether it be the Roman Rite or, or you know, the um, various rites, the, the Mozambique Rite, or, or, or any of these traditions which were held in Spain, France, things amongst people that hold to theology consistent with today's Eastern Orthodox Church, which has not departed from that. And I would say Western uh, pseudo-Christianity, I, I guess, uh, the, the modern Christian churches of the West are, are a representation of the apostasy from that one undivided faith, whereas the Eastern tradition, for the most part, has remained that. Of course, there are churches that have come from like the Jehovah's Witnesses and, and other evangelical Christian churches and, and um, 
uh, Pentecostal churches, which originate in the West and have spread into the East. So you see that in in, in Russia, in Greece, you, you see these churches, these Protestant churches, and and in Islam and other religions that that are there too. It's not like it's not like they don't exist, but they didn't originate there. The, those Western um, apostasy religions they originate in the West and then they spread to the East in an effort to evangelize them, and and so it's taken root to some small effect. But and that doesn't represent those traditions, though. So although they're there today, they most certainly don't originate there. So my comment on this was from Aquinas forward is starting kind of late and coming towards the very recent, theologically speaking. The West was predominantly Christian by the 4th century, but this doesn't start, this course is what I'm referring to, this course doesn't start until the 13th century. I would consider the 11th century on a spiraling fall of Christianity in the West, but this course only looks at that period. Far too late. The, this period is the apostasy of the West, not what Western Christians should be looking to. The Western theological tradition should primarily be looking at the first millennia, in my opinion. And that is, of course, because it represents the one undivided church. It represents a, a fullness of Christianity having come to the earth. And, and that is a fullness which in the Eastern Orthodox Church we still enjoy. It has not departed. We have never departed from the faith. We have never... Uh, created new doctrines. We've never embraced new age theologies and, and new age uh, doctrines. We've never had to create uh, forgeries in order to support our episcopacy. Our, our episcopacy is a synodal episcopacy, which is the episcopacy that you see of the conciliar ecumenical councils. We didn't need a donation of Constantine. We didn't need any of these other forgeries to create the authority of, of our bishops. They stand as patriarchs alone. And then as we move on through history, we didn't need to reform. We didn't need to create a new church. We didn't need to, I, I mean, essentially to me, this the, the, the Protestant idea of, of reformation is, is synonymous with the making Christ to be a false prophet. And and I say that because Christ says that I shall build my church upon this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Uh, to quote from the redactions of St. Augustine, this refers not to Peter himself, but to Christ. Uh, Peter, uh, St. Augustine had initially said that this referred to Peter, but in his redactions, uh, which he, he goes back to reflect on, on the teachings that he had done earlier in his life, he goes back and, and clarifies, edits that to show that this is not Peter, but this is rather Christ. The Christ is the rock, um, which is reflected and reverberated throughout the writings of Peter himself and, and the other parts of the New Testament. But the Orthodox Church has never needed to do this. And so when Protestants say that, oh, the church died away or, or the church uh, went through major errors or there was huge um, theological errors that had to be uh, redone, this is synonymous. This is the same as, as accusing uh, the church of, of the gates of hell of having prevailed against it. That, you know, a lot of Protestants actually hold to this belief that until the Reformation, that the church had actually uh, fallen, that, that the uh, Catholic slash Orthodox Church, the undivided church of the first millennia, that from early on in church history until the Reformation in the in the like 14 and 1500s, that it had kind of gone through this period where the gates of hell essentially had prevailed against it. Well, you know, that's to make Christ out to be a false prophet. So this is theologically un... un uh, incapable, I guess. It, it doesn't stand. It, it, it is false. It's not true. Like, you can't say that and then also claim to be a Christian. This would be to make Christ out to be a false prophet. Uh, so, yeah, I, I can't... The Orthodox Church doesn't need to do that. So, you see within the first millennia a, a very strong connection during the period of the Desert Fathers between them and the Celtic monks in Ireland and throughout Britain and Scotland, or what would later become Scotland. And 
you know, there's lots of uh, synonymous things. They have a very uh, strong uh, connection between one another. And you see in their writings, or what we have, I, I have a book, um, I, I re actually read a passage from it uh, a few weeks ago on, on my channel uh, called The Celtic Monk. It's available at uh, uh, Holy Trinity, uh, is it Holy Trinity uh, Orthodox Monastery in West Virginia, uh, one of the, the Russian Orthodox uh, monasteries there, or in America. I, that might be the only Russian Orthodox monastery, I think. I'm not, not entirely sure. I think there's a few, but that's the one I'm most familiar with. So uh, that is a book there called The Celtic Monk. It goes over a lot of writings. These are writings that uh, would disagree. They, they, they show a, a period of history where there's a strong connection with what would someone just reading without knowing where it came from would see the connection to today's Orthodox Church, and they would see no connection with other uh, groups who claim to be the ancient church. Uh, they would see things from other churches that, that this theologically do not line up uh, on like areas of how Orthodox Christians regard the Eucharist, which is slightly different than how, uh, say, the the modern papal Catholic Church or, or Protestant churches regard uh, communion or the Eucharist. So, yeah, so this is a course which looks at, uh, they claim it's the Western theological tradition. I would argue that this is the Western apostasy from Christianity. It does not represent the, um, the Western theological tradition. It represents um, a, a, a full-scale movement away from that. And so most of these authors, Thomas Aquinas, Art Martin Luther, um, they, they do still, for the most part, hold to a Christianity which is far closer to orthodoxy or, or Eastern orthodoxy today than what Protestant and even Catholic churches do. But they still are, are, are the, the early origins, the early movement away from orthodox Christianity. They are the movement away from that fir first millennia undivided church. And that is why I have difficulty with this claim that these authors, these people, these writers, these uh, you know men who who legitimately probably were seeking God to the best of their ability. Thomas Aquinas definitely represents the most orthodox of the Western writers living in the 13th century. So. Uh, I will give him that. Martin Luther, for his part, represents probably the most orthodox um, person in German amongst German Catholic monks at the time. So, so I, I I give credit where credit is due. But this is not still not by the the first century, uh, first millennia undivided church by a long shot. You guys take it easy, and I'll talk to you in a video coming soon.